This video is a little bit different to the normal videos that I put out on Little Car, but it's um, sort of a companion to the Volvo 400 series video that I've uh, put out on the Big Car channel, and I'm very lucky to be able to um, have an interview with Steve Harper, who's uh, basically one of the people who designed the Volvo 400 series. So it was wonderful that he could um, you know, spend some time and, and give me a lot of information about it. He's actually also the person who designed the Escort RS Cosworth, and we talk a little bit about that later on in the video. But um, there's some small parts of the video which I've put in the Volvo 400 series video, but um, there was so much good stuff that we talked about that I thought I'd do a video where basically I put the whole video out so that uh, you can enjoy it. So here it is. Maybe we could start with how you first got involved in the Volvo 400 series. I trained at the Royal College of Art and after leaving the Royal College of Art, the, I went back to British Leyland. And at the time when I first returned, the, the design director was a guy called David Bache. Um, he led, uh, as we've heard in your other stories, got sacked on a very famous day with boy Harold Musgrove. I mean, David didn't retire gracefully he, he left and decided he should then team up with another group of people and um, influence other designs and in fact david was involved with a group that became consultants at volvo bv the operate the volvo operation in holland and david was there for looking for designers at the time there were two designers uh, working on the 400 series and that was Peter Horbury working on the interior, and a guy called John DeFries, who was working on the exterior of the 480. It was his 480 that had been chosen. Um, Peter was due to return to uh, his consulting company, and John DeFries had moved to was moving to DAF. So myself and a guy called Chris Johnson went there to take over the role, their roles, and I took over John DeFries's role, and therefore became the chief designer or effective chief designer on the 480 program. Um, and it was during that time where the car was going through those awkward times between the Swedes deciding what they, how they wanted it to, to be more Volvo. And one of my classics was I did the kind of launch sketch and I kind of got more and more into it and started to explore the different aspects of how you make it more of a Volvo, because clearly it was, it was a swooping shape where everything else up in Sweden was of the style of the, you know, the Wilsgaard box. We did have a blue book. Um, it was the definitions of all the things that you needed to have to make a Volvo. I say that because I kept that for the 460. But on the 480, it was already in, in place. The Most of the design was already there. However, the one thing that we did have was just a Volvo diagonal sitting above the bumper and uh, on that front panel and it was felt that it wasn't significant enough so i was asked to come up with another solution to give it more presence um while at um, british leyland um roy axe had taken over from um david Bache, and i think we were, we'd been doing the mg exe and roy brought his ferrari 308 in that uh, one day in, into the studio and one of the key things on the Ferraris at the time was their low set grill with the Ferrari badge in the middle of the, the low set grill. So I did the famous sketch where I put a Volvo grill underneath the bumper with the diagonal. And that was chosen as the face of the 480 as a more Volvo type design. So that was probably my biggest influence. And it caused shockwaves throughout the um, Volvo fraternity because how dare you put the Volvo badge underneath the bumper? You know, that's the dirty area. Well, that's what, what happened, and that's the only way we did it, and we got it through into production, and that was that was the end of that story, yeah. Mm, so you had to put it somewhere, and they, people weren't happy putting it above the number plate, above the bumper. Um, just because I, I saw from the designs, people tried different sort of ways of doing that, and seemingly people weren't happy with that. No, they, I mean, as well as the, the cooling, is the, the main the main radiator was set low anyway. So the area above was 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 just not going to work. 
um, and putting a grill there would have just killed that whole design. So, you know, that was the, that was the inspiration. And of course, I then used the fog lamps down below to create the kind of classic grill and lamp. Um, oh, sort of right. Shape. That so makes it sense. Was, it was an upside down Volvo. <laughs> So was the 480 the first one you started looking at? Presumably because the 480 yeah. was going to be the first one that was going to be launched. Yeah, it was It was a very interesting philosophy of introducing your sports version before you did your hatch and, uh, a hatch and your notch, and it, they literally came in that order. G15 was under development um, primarily led by a guy called Peter van Keilenberg, and um, interior again was done by Peter Halbury, uh, and then Chris Johnson took over. Um and I inherited it again. It was kind of mid-development, and the engineering was being done by IAD in in Worthing in England. Uh, they had been working over in in Holland, and then they'd moved the engineering um, operations back to Worthing. So it was me as the English guy um, working in Holland, and then having to go on business trips back down to, back to England. So I got christened as Stefan van Harper. Um, as the you know the, the the flying Dutchman or should we say the flying Englishman, um, and I used to go over to regular trips to England where we were engineering the whole of the exterior from you know designing little details like the the door mirrors and the, and the drip rail to make sure it only allowed one drop per fifteen minutes to go on the seat, which was a Volvo specification standard specification at the time. So, you know, we, 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 we had to work hard to make sure it met the Volvo regs. But I was there for the beginning of the 460. Mm. Now, 460 being the sedan, alongside the then kind of G2 program, which was just starting, which was the effectively the 850 program, was interesting because it fell into that category. The Volvo hadn't really done the 850 yet but they were still kind of very much in the 24760 mold in their thinking. So we had to try and make sure that the 460 ref reflected as much of the sedan values of Volvo as possible. And that really meant, you know, trying to get the back, the, the rear window as upright as possible, which allowed us a, a better trunk space. The rear lamps were done classic Volvo style, you know, six boxes, each lamp in an individual box. So, yeah, that was the one that we really then had to focus on. And we also started looking at federal versions, and I did some versions of it with the larger bumpers and things like that. And, and then during that time as we were doing that, 480 had started to become seen. It was it was launched. Um, and that's when I started to do the proposals for the Cabrio because I felt that it just needed to have something added to it to give it that bit more dynamic sporting appeal, especially as they were still umming and ahhing about whether to go to the US or not. And I felt the convertible was the classic car for California. And I tried the short wheelbase and the standard wheelbase version, four seaters and two seaters. Myself and another designer called Paul Steenstra was, uh, were involved in it. And we prepared and produced the first mock-ups, clay models and they were all in the studio and Rob Koch, you show everybody around and everybody was totally into it. And then they took the photographs up to Sweden and it was like, how dare you do a convertible? You can't have convertibles. You're, we're Volvo. So that's when the Targa Burgle, the Targa Bar came in as, as, as a, an integral part of the design. And even then they still wouldn't accept it. So although we produced, I think, five prototypes um, and the show car, which sits in the Volvo Museum up in Gothenburg. That was the end of that story. So apparently there's a couple of uh, convertibles. Maybe some people have actually made them themselves. They're actually out in the wild. Um, there are actually some of the original prototypes. There was a room oh, okay. certain members of the senior staff at Volvo squirreled a few away to make sure they didn't end up in the, um, in the scrap. Because that's the sort of thing to see, you know, if the Swedes decide you're not going to do it, then it went straight to the scrapyard, mate. There was no questions about putting it in the museum. It was gone. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I mean, there actually was a convertible of the 200 series back in the early 80s. I think Bertoni did one. Um, right. so, I mean, so, but, but, but there were, uh, from my understanding, Volvo were kind of freaked out that, you know, like uh, rollover, worries and they're the safety company and you know there'd be problems like that so was there a real 
push, I guess there was a real push to put a, a roll bar over it after, but were the torsional problems without having a roll bar? No, actually, believe it or not, we the, the, the guys that were working on it had had a lot of experience doing convertibles. Um, we worked with ASC, American Sunroof Company. So they, they brought a lot of expertise in from doing stuff in the States. Um, and uh, they were very much involved in, in making sure the structure was sound. And the, the target bar was very much part of that strength. We even looked at the stag solution about linking it to the windscreen to reduce a little bit of the scuttle shape that you get convert on convertibles. But in the end, we went for a conventional target bar where the seat belts were molded. It was interesting because in later years, SIPS, the rollover protection system, developed, was actually developed for the C first C70, which again was Pete Horbury working with TWR. Um, after G2, the 850 was done, then C70 started in uh, 91 or thereabouts when Peter left, Volvo, uh, left to go back to Volvo in Sweden. And he, that started the C70 program, which was a full convertible without a target bar. So uh, <laughs> full circle, yeah. They eventually did get convertibles without target bars. And if anybody, and I, I later got involved, of course, in the C70, the latter C70 program, or the last of the C70 programs. So yeah, I finally did get a convertible at Volvo. So what was it like working at Volvo? It sounds like, I mean, they, they've had people working there for many, many years. I, From what I can see, it seems to be a fairly harmonious place to work. Oh, very much. I mean, that's the, at the time in, in, in 85, when, when I first went there, obviously there was the Dutch studio, which was a newly built studio, uh, obviously away from DAF, because DAF had become the truck factory. So in Helmand, probably about uh, five kilometres away, five, six, ten kilometres away, they built a new studio. And even the bricks and the whole layout of the studio echoed exactly the same as the buildings in Gothenburg. It was a copy paste. This is Volvo. This is Volvo in Holland, and their attitudes, the, the the kind of level management system that you have in Volvo was very much there. Everybody could have an opinion. Everybody could get involved, and I think that's one of the nicest parts about working for Volvo. Is it was always that that openness to ideas, and yeah, it was it was very fair. And I think it, it, it's a reflection of the kind of Swedish society that openness mm -hmm. and openness that comes into the Volvo brand. And I, many years later, I did many talks involving talking how Volvo's culture and, and Swedish culture kind of mixed. And the Dutch and the, the Swedes actually were quite similar mentalities. It's interesting because living in Holland, if you watch the program in English, like Forty Towers or Monty Python, it was always shown in an original language with subtitles, as it was in Sweden, whereas in France or Germany, it was always dubbed. So their ability to speak English and kind of become anglicised or whatever was much more obvious in the likes of Sweden and Volvo, and therefore, uh, Sweden and Holland. And therefore, they kind of, there was more connecting them perhaps than the met the eye and i mean you, you've talked before about the joint the, uh, the joining of volvo and um daft being awkward at first and i'm sure it was but after a while they started to understand each other um there was still a bit of an us and them i think that even to the later years when every, when the studio in holland was closed and the guys moved up to sweden um there was still oh they're the Dutch ones, you know, the, 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 it wasn't, oh, they, they've got the Dutch ideas. They're not really properly Volvo. So, the, and, and there was a little bit of disparity between the two groups, but in reality, over time, that just disappeared. And it, I mean, probably put um, a coat hook in the, in the, in the, in the foyer of Volvo. And I said, well, why have you put it here? And he said, well, that's where come people, when they come to Volvo, they hang their egos there because when you come to Volvo, you're working for the brand, wherever you come from. And we were, I think 21 nationalities at one point working in the studio. Wow. Yeah. And, but we all produced, you know, Swedish products. We all understood how it was to make a Volvo a Volvo. So, and yeah. that had infused even down to the, the Dutch operations. You know, they, they understood. And that's why the, the 480 had been luckily kind of, yeah, I mean, Gothenburg did contribute to the program. Um, there were some very, 
like the tundra kind of Bertone tundra type 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 things. But the car itself was clearly more European in its its, its approach. Um, but however, towards the end, towards the 460, we then got it a little bit more. So it actually kind of the cars matured in their in their form from the young and sporting 480 through to the 460, which was becoming you know almost a product of of, of Gothenburg up to the then 850, later 850, and and on to the the, you know, the nine the nine nine sixties nine eight uh, et cetera et cetera. So presumably the focus, first of all, was on the 400 series and then on the 800 series. They were trying to get the 400 series out first. Correct, yes. The the 400, I can actually remember doing sketches during my t- latter year, I think 86, we were doing sketches for the G2 programme. So yeah, the, four, the 400 was already well on the way before the G2. They were, I mean, they were happy with producing the, um, the 240s and the 740s. They, they got their market, they knew their market. Interestingly, I mean, they were selling, I don't know, 400,000 cars in those days. And even years later, when I returned in 2000, they were still, they had a range of eight or six or seven cars and they were still selling the same volumes. It's only 400 or 600,000. It, it didn't really change. It was yeah. only later that, that they've kind of conquered more markets as, as, as they've hit China and places like that. But Volvo's volume globally was, was always about, about the same. And you okay. can tell in, 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 even in the UK. Yeah. So going back to the 480, um, so with the um, it was sort of an on and again, off again thing with the USA, from my understanding, was there a temptation to get rid of those big bumpers and pop up headlights, which, of course, are very expensive um, with the with the US rule changes? Or did they just think, let's just get it out the door? No, I mean, the original intention from day one had been to go to the US. The pop up lamp was still very very um very much on vogue and still very much the sign of the sports cars however there were f- um facelift proposals done later um whereby the headlamps could have been made into the into the area which is where the driving lamp is the f- problem was when the 480 was originally conceived the us lighting regs basically only allowed for two headlamps and that was the round seven inch Maybe the three, maybe the five and five and a half inch, and the rectangular one, which appeared on many cars during the kind of seventies and eighties, and that was because they obviously you could buy them in any corner store, mart, or whatever. So the ability to be able to put one of those into into the four eighty just didn't exist. It would have just kind of completely spoiled the front end. So that's why they decided to stay with the the pop up lamps. However, during that latter part in the nineties. Headlamp regs in the US changed and you could have more kind of styled lamps. And it was then seen we could have actually then put a more styled lamp into the front of the 480 uh, and met the US regs. So, again, it was still a little bit in, in mind to try and do it. But I think the marketing and, and the kind of whole productionized getting it out of the States was just an homolog- cost of homologation was perhaps a little bit too much. I'm not too sure whether the the Renault engine was uh, was clean enough either. Well, that could have been an issue, yeah. yeah. And on your website, um, you have a touring car version which you've drawn. So was the temptations for them to take it into motorsports? There was... Holland is known, as, uh, as you've mentioned before, for such qualities as backward caravan racing. Um, um wonderful. <laughs> yeah, and I'd, 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 I'd driven around Zandvoort a few times in my old Austin Healy, and um, Rob Koch, who was the um, head of design, was once the head of DAF Motorsport. So there was always in Rob's mind the will to, to wish to get back into some sort of motorsport. They'd had great success with the last of the 66s and things like that. Um so there was a, a, always a will to try and get into motorsport. There was a love. I mean, there was, there was circuits all around that area um, and people, especially rally cross as well as, as, as track racing up at, um, uh, 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 up at the Sands. So, yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, there was always a will to get it, but I don't think there was ever the finance. And I'm sure at that time, Volvo weren't particularly interested in getting into motorsport either. They, they'd done a few cars in, safari rallies or things like that maybe a private entry 240 whatever but there was never any 
sporting intent until we saw the uh, BTCC um, likes of the, um, uh, the the A50 state. There had been, like I say, I think the 240 would had been done in various motorsport guises um, for a good while, but most of them were private entrants. There was no kind of official Volvo entry. Yeah, fair enough. That makes sense. Um, so the going back, going over to the 460, um, which you talked briefly about, um, the, obviously the design brief is to make it look a lot like a, a 700 series, which sort of makes sense. Were there any other requirements about like sort of cargo space requirements, um, things like that? Yeah, I mean, the whole blue book, That's a, it was a, a definition of, of how you make a Volvo. Um, defined all the kind of things about, you know, the, the kind of exterior and interior features, but also, yes, the ability to get, uh, there's a certain ratio of trunk space and, and, and suitcase size that we had to make sure fitted, which again had come from Sweden. So, you know, the um, different places in the world have different regulations set up by different needs. I mean, if you design a car in Munich, you have to design it to be able to get a couple of beer crates in. You know, at a minimum, you've got to be able to get the beer crates into the trunk. Oh, duh. Volvo, <laughs> Volvo was all about, you know, I'm not, I'm not joking when I say, you know, you have to get a couple of boxes of Ikea definitely into the back of the vehicle. So the oh. trunk needs to be a certain width to be able to get things in. You had to open. I mean, the opening angle, for instance, had to be more than on most cars. You know, most cars came up to there. Volvo, he had to fold away. So meant the hinging and the position of the rear screen and all had to be adapted based on the Volvo regulations. So yes, um, there clearly was more than just six boxes in the rear lamp. It was just, it was a very defining brief of things that you'd had to do to meet Volvo spec. And because it was a sedan, therefore it was better, more written Obviously, the hatchback for the four forty was was a little bit more open because they didn't produce a hatchback, and of course the four eighty, well, didn't really meet any of the requirements. You know, it wasn't it wasn't an out and out of state car, so he didn't fall into those definitions. So uh, that that were lucky in those two cars to be able to get away with a mm. little bit of freedom. But by the time you got to four sixty, then it was clearly you had to meet the rules of the blue book. And my understanding is they never entertained the idea of an estate because they didn't want to eat into a, a 700. They were scared. They, yeah, there was clearly an indication that, that it's interesting when you look at different companies and how they operate, whereby some companies don't like, want to have a competitive car within a, a close segment of their own. And other companies encourage it because it sells more cars. Um, and clearly Volvo were concerned that the 240 was still around and living on its laurels and therefore we're concerned that the 480 might sorry a 460 wagon or 440 wagon uh, could have potentially stole sales from it but at the end of the day they went and produced the 850 as a replacement anyway so that kind of did the job and if there had been a 4 460 440 um, wagon then that would have fitted quite neatly underneath the 850 mm. yeah so I mean it might be 40 and be 60 later yeah i mean i think it makes sense because uh, i mean the 200 series and the estates just went on forever so it you know that they, they had sort of a low-end estate for people to buy um i mean it was clear they, they clearly had a market segment that they understood they understood the person you know the teacher with the corduroy jacket and the arm pads that kind of bought the um the, the leather arm pads that bought the the 240 and there were people who Bought the 760, they were slightly different. And I think that the, the younger generation that were buying the 440s, I say younger, they were probably 58 rather than 62. Um, <laughs> average age. Um, you know, they, they, they still had the need for a wagon, but there's also the fact that they were producing the hatchback and they were scared perhaps if they made the, the wagon, they'd kill the hatchback. Right. Who, you know, I think there's the, it came from it came from both sides. Yeah, fair enough. So um, you did mention the 440 briefly. It sounded like you only really sort of supervised the last parts of the 440. Were there any yeah, other? Yeah, the production icing, yeah. It was Peter van Kylenberg that had done the, um, 
the majority of the work. Okay. Um, I, I did. I did look at some federal versions of it. Again, that was also one of the considerations whether we could take those cars to the stage because obviously the volumes would have been far better for the Bourne production plant if we could have got US involvement. But uh, so yeah, I, it was productionizing of the of the four forty. It's good what you're doing, mate. Because um, I'm working with a guy called Steve Saxty at the moment who's writing the Escorts Hosworth story amongst all these other. Uh, I don't know oh, if okay. you know books. The Fords you've always promised yourself, the cars you've always promised yourself, they're really thick books. Okay. And he's wow. now working on the volume th twos and threes, which I've, you know, I've done the full Escort Cosworth story in there and mm -hmm. kind of disproved, um, what's his name? The McLaren man for, who's saying you put the triple wing on there because that was a complete fallacy and that no triple wing was ever done on the case. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was... Uh, yeah, it's obviously something you're pretty proud of that that escort Cosworth, and and to be able to make a Sierra look like an escort, that that's pretty good. <laughs> it was even more interesting when we actually got them to move the engine because one of the big problems we had on the early cars was that the engine was too far forward, mm -hmm. and the first cars, the first ones I designed, I had to have a huge bump on the front end of the air of the of the hood, and um, just couldn't get it look to look right. And so we got them to move the, the engine back. And as soon as they started to do that, we really left the Sierra floor pan a long way behind because it really then became a new hybrid of an Escort and a, a Sierra. So, yeah, there was there was not much left of the Sierra by the time I finished with it. But yeah. the nice thing, obviously, was that the fact that the front wheels were slightly further forward, which allowed us more space to get the, the fenders in and the vents on the back of the fenders and all those kind of things. And getting the car, this is the first production car ever to have downforce. It was zero lift in the standard form and 40 kilos downforce in the extended spoiler form. So, mm. you know, that was a trial. But even then, that was a... We got the first... Carmen built a, a lash-up body, which we then attached all the aero aids. We made in foam and clay. We put took over to Cologne, put into the winter and all the... These big old propellers wound the, the speed up to 100 mile an hour. And there was this almighty bang, clatter. And I'm just kind of looking up thinking, oh, God, all those, you know, John Brady's parts that he'd made because he worked at MGO where, where it was also done. So he was also part of that story. Um, we, uh, I thought all those parts had ended up, you know, back in the fans and broken one of the fans because they'd come off. But actually it was the hood had come open at 100 mile an hour. Oh, because... Carmen had supplied the car, but they hadn't put a hood latch on it. They'd only put a little hook. And of course, at 100 mile an hour, the hood just lifted <laughs> off and hit the windscreen. And we had to, we'd only got two days to do all the tests. And there was the car with a smashed windscreen and a roof which peaked. And luckily, Dieter Hahn and the uh, motorsport guys were on hand. And his guys came in and they panel beated the car. Oh, wow to shape within a couple of hours and put an aluminium, rolled aluminium windscreen. So the first pictures of the car have a glass windscreen. The second picture of the car has got an aluminium windscreen. <laughs> we'd had to re completely rebuild the roof, bonnet, and windscreen yeah. Yeah, to, yeah. to continue with the tests. And that's where we eventually got the rear wing at the right height and things like that, the rear um, the tray spoiler at the right height. And that was, you know, wow. key key experimentation and then that we took that data and put it back onto the clay so yeah if, if i do an escort rs cosworth story i touch on it briefly in my escort video but uh if i do a full one i think i might hit you up again <laughs> myself and steve saxley saxley's there i mean he's been able to get into the archives of ford and all this lot and find all these oh. other components that went you know there was a, a mule built on an old uh, the previous model Escort, which looks actually sensational, you know. Um, mm. And then there was all these other derivatives that were going to be did. I actually did a derivative of it later for Rod Mansfield, who moved to Aston Martin, and we did a proposal for an Escort six-cylinder engine version of the Escort Cosworth floor pan um, as a new Aston Martin, and I designed it around the, um, the DB4 DB Zagato, the original Zagato. DB4 Zagato? Yeah, DB4 Zagato. 
And um, that, I think I've got a scale model of pictures on, on, my, on my website. And unfortunately, we were in competition against a car called the DB7 by a guy called Ian Callum, based on the XJS. And of course, all that technology exists. Rods was an advanced car that was, would have been too expensive to produce. So Ian's car won, the um, DB7 won out. So it was always, at that time, there's a lot of me versus Ian Callum, because Ian, of course, was also involved in doing a lot of the, some of the later work on, on tweaking the front end of the Escort Cosworth. So, you know, Ian and I were kind of, we knew each other and uh, we were still very much involved. The, um, the One of the stories I remember from that is that we, um, we organised a car clinic in Blackpool where we, we, we had to take all the badges off the clay models and whatever. And it was, it was in a swimming, it was in an area of, of Blackpool, one of the Blackpool um, center, leisure center or whatever it was called. And they basically boarded over the swimming pool. Um, so to make this room usable oh. as a, a car clinic. And they obviously they drove the Polo and the 127 and all these other cars in there which weigh, you know, kind of like you know, half a tonne at the most. And then they brought the clay model in, which was weighs a tonne, <laughs> and they positioned it. And then they were kind of, luckily, one of the clay modelers stayed behind a bit long. He was, he was kind of tidying up some detail, and he started to hear this groaning and creaking noise, and then the kind of sound of wood splitting, and the back of the car started to drop and realised that the car was about to go in the swimming pool. So, you know, that's a call. The water's still underneath there. To come and push the car to the side so it sat on the side of the pool. So he didn't, because the car, the clay model almost ended up in the swimming pool. Very, very, um, what's, it, what's his name? The guy, Keith Moon style. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, but probably not quite as intentional. <laughs> so here's, here are the cars you're looking at, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the, here's the car A, car B. Oh, car C is the one in the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So many things going off. I should have muted them. Anyway, thank you very much, Steve. This is really <laughs> okay. good. Okay, super. Yeah. Take yeah. care. Take care. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye. A big thank you to all my patrons for supporting me. To get early advert free access to new videos or to appear in the credits, please consider supporting me using the Patreon link below from just $1 or 80p a month and hit that subscribe button to get notified of new videos. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.